So here's the introduction slide, which you all have seen already. And thanks again, Melvin, for the great intro and, uh, and inviting me for this lecture. It really made the end of my year bright as a result of this. So, um, you've probably seen some of the abstract already, but, but essentially I've been working on this for 25 years, did my PhD in bit physics as a mathematical model using for quantum computing, geometric algebra in 2002. And that was the time when Chris Doran at, at Cambridge was working on geometric algebra as well. And since he's was geom he was working on all of physics geometric algebra. So if you haven't seen his PDF out there, go get it or I can send it to you. Um, and, and, and so it's, we were both working at it at the same time. We just didn't know that we were at the time. Um, and then I wrote a book that was talking about a lot of this stuff too. And, uh, it's been released two years ago already. And, um, and the, here's some of the key concepts and we're going to talk about it some more. Bits are physical. This is Landauer's principle. Bits are protophysical. I, it, tongue in cheek said, called that the Matsky principle because <laughs> to go along with the other one. And then their bits are hyperdimensional. And this is related to a kind of a neuro computing model, but all of this stuff is heavily math oriented. So must have people who appreciate math to understand the value of all this stuff. I'm going to go into more of this in a minute. So, so here's my um, bio here. Um, you know, my moniker is quantum Doug because my mat, my last name is too hard to spell. And um, so quantumdug.com is my website, and I've been programming for over 55 years. I'm an IEEE member, life member. I was a senior member technical staff at Tex Texas Instruments, worked there 25 years. And then when I was there, I did the Fis Comp Physics and Computing Conference in 92 and 94. And what's interesting is there was a, a FISCOMP in 1981 and another one in 1996. And the, two, and the guy who hosted those two conferences on physics and computing were um, Tom Toffley from, from MIT and then Boston University. So there's only been two chairmen of these conferences, Tom Toffley and, me, and myself. And so I started working on an AMPA session. AMPA is Alternate Natural Philosophy Association. And in 1994, we had a session from them. And that's where I met Mike Manthe. And that's a UK oriented um, uh, um, organization. And they had very prestigious and famous members that were a member of that. Uh, organization. So you can see my three AMPA talks in the recent online, YouTube, they had their online conference in August. And so there's three talks out there that go into a lot of this in more detail. I wrote a famous paper called Will Physic Physical Scalability Sabotage Performance Games. It was in um, 1997 for IEEE Computer Magazine. And it's sort of like the, the reference document about wires don't, why wires don't scale. Essentially, I applied relativity constraints to semiconductors. Um, and how time and space are not, don't scale and they're relative as a result of this. So this is kind of, so you can see some of my thinking. And um, so I've been, I'm gonna go on to the other stuff since this is the more background that's related to working with my, I've been working on geometric algebra now since my dissertation and we built a mo modern tool and we'll show you that in a minute. Okay, so I love this cartoon to start out with, with your guys group, you're interested in, in simulation and so, Dilbert says, I created a simulated world made entirely of software. I programmed all the people in the simulation to think they're real people with free will. And, um, and are they sent to beings? They think they are. What if they discover their true nature? I programmed limits into their physics so they can never observe the walls of their reality. For example, they can't get to the edge of the universe because they can't exceed the speed of light and they can't find out who they are made of because it looks like probability at the quantum level. Wouldn't those limits tip off the smart ones? I coded them not to trust smart people. I mean, this is so funny because it's so wrong in so many ways, you know. Feynman says nature isn't classical, damn it, it's quantum mechanical. And, it, and, and if you want to make a simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical. And by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. And so you can know of the movie, The Matrix, right? So this is a bit matrix that simulates the universe, but it has to be more powerful to simulate the entire universe. You're talking about a simulation model and you have to have an infrastructure. I worked in simulation for 10 or 15 years. So I get simulation at a very fundamental level. And I also understand design of quantum systems and classical systems as well, algorithms. And so um, you have to have something, you have to have a quantum substrate that is required to sufficiently, efficiently simulate a quantum universe. So you have to have something that's pre-quantum if you wanna think about it that. And I call this the proto-bit substructure or bit physics. And, and it's like a bit matrix, okay? So, so bits, I really think, um, Melvin, I, I'm, 
I, you know, I would like to discuss this with you. I think bits are more fundamental than a fifth state of matter because um, bits are pre-matter, pre-space, pre-time. In other words, they actually form the infrastructure in which all of that other stuff happens. And we know that must be true because even empty space has quantum foam in it. So there's, there's something supporting quantum foam and, um, and even in empty space. And when there's, we're quote, there's nothing in it, right? But yet, yet um, you can have the quantum foam produce particle antiparticle pairs probabil probabilistically. And that's what black hole mechanics is all about. So, um, so just realize that here, bits are physical. Landauer's principle, they know that, you know, they know Ehlers with it from bit, right? That bits are the smallest increment to a black hole they can make. It's about Planck's area on the side. And all the bits get turned into the surface area of the black hole. And you can say, well, physics wise, that makes sense. But mathematically, it makes sense too, that the volume of the of a hyperdimensional sphere is all on its surface area. There is no inside, even just from a mathematics perspective. So a black hole has nothing inside of it. It's a singularity. It's a giant singularity point with nothing inside, no space and no time. So no matter what the physicists say, oh yeah, time and space are inverted. There's the center of the black hole. No, it's one giant point. If you got to look at it from the mathematics moment. So, so bits are protophysical and this means that you can use topological math to do this. And why I say topological math, and I'll talk about this in a second here. If you use a representation for bits that's not Boolean algebra, but topological bits, then you can use a mathematics that's common to both science and computer science and physics. Okay, so, it, so bits are physical. They're part of physics now. The computer science does not own bits anymore. Physics owns them. And it's not just a unit of measure, it's a fundamental um, discrete thing in the universe. Um, and it shows up in black holes, it from bits. So, um, and this geometric algebra approach I'm doing is mostly, I say mostly equivalent to Hilbert spaces because there's a few exceptions and we can talk about that as well. And so then we're talking about if you take a large sets of those more than 20 at a time, you get this odd particular behavior called correlithms and this thing called standard distance. And I'll talk about that. And it's actually information generating. It's kind of like a negative, negative entropy way of looking at things because normally things are randomly generated and that's entropy, you know, the highest level of entropy. But if you have something that's less than random, then it's ordered and it shows up in the mathematics and the information content in this. So it's, it connects hyperdimensional math with, with what's going on in neural computing. So it's a bit like bit space, bit soup, is space-like though. I just wanna make sure that we're gonna show this some more in a minute here. So here's to kind of put it in perspective, right? Most people think, oh, there's classical realm, there's the quantum realm, we get down to electrons and quarks. And then there's people who's talking about the Planck scale, the quantum foam, strings and membranes and brain theory from bit. And so there's this line here where you have space-time metrics above this line, which is the, the place where matter and energy and space and time exist. And that's down at the Planck scale, okay? But then I'm talking about is the space below that. It's a hyperspace. We don't have space and we don't have time yet. And that's what's interesting about my dissertation on quantum geometric algebra for um, quantum computing is that I don't assume that we have time yet. We're just looking at the structure, the topological structure of qubits built on bits, okay? So just realize when I'm talking about it, I'm not talking about anything above the line, I'm talking about everything below the line. And I believe that structure shows up below the line for bits, qubits, and even ebits. Okay, so that's when I'm saying it's more than just a fifth state of matter because a fifth state of matter would be above the line. And I'm saying, no, we're below the line, okay? So, um, and so here's another way to look at that same, it says you can start with zero dimensions, okay? What is that? It's void of all distinctions. And if you know about law of form and any, any of the work that's down out in California, they talk about distinctions and, and the void and all this mathematics that they do. Um, okay, but then you can go to single bit, bit physics. And I call this, I'm gonna review this again at the end, but it's bit physics. It's like, if you have a single distinction, the smallest distinction you can make is a bit. And, and this is a way of representing topologically as a vector rather than as a Boolean algebra statement, okay? This vector is orthogonal to all other dimensions and that matches what's going on in Hilbert space. So then you can take two of these and you can get a flat world out of it. But it turns out when you have two dimensions, and I'm going to show again more how, what this means. I'm just kind of giving you an overview summary about where I'm going here. 
um, you end up having two of these classical bits because they're they really are classical bits. It's just they happen to be orthonormal representation, right? As soon as you do that, you get qubits. That's what my dissertation about was 20 years ago. But you also get neutrinos and bosons, and we'll talk about that. And you can say, oh, that's interesting. Neutrinos and bosons are the weirdest things. There, we can't see them in the universe very easily. Well, it's because they're two dimensional. That makes so much sense when you look at it from that perspective. Finally, you get to 3D, you have a classical worldview and a standard model with space, time, matter, and energy. But finally, you go and you have quaternions, okay? Quaternions are, you know, essentially the bell elements of, of space, space. If you have i, j, and k, it turns out we can show that they're equivalent to ge geometric algebra expressions and has exactly the definition of quaternions, which is great because that means that, that now you can represent space itself in a primitive way in geometric algebra because we can support the quaternions. So, so finally you get what I call the space-time divide. So now you have to have 3D plus time. You want a relativistic worldview and you want time dilation and space contraction and quantum field theory and you want, you know, Lorentz contract, Lorentz uh, invariance, right? And so, so that, and that's what you have to do to support even just regular physics. You know, we know of quantum gravity and things like that. So finally, you get a space-like divide where you go to 4D. Turns out every EBIT, if you look at it from a mathematical perspective, is four dimensions. And the reason why it looks like it's spooky action at a distance is because it's four dimensional and we're looking at it from a three dimensional perspective, okay? And what's interesting here is we have a four dimensional version of quaternions that Mike, Mike Manthe coined the term quaternions. And if you look at them, they're just a higher dimensional version of quaternions. I'll show you what that is in a minute. And if you look at the structure of that, it's quaternions in a four-dimensional space simulating a three-dimensional space, and it's entangled. And that level to see that. And we'll and that I wrote a talk about already 10 years ago or 15 years ago about how entanglement is pervasive and it's you know everywhere in physics, and it's because of this kind of idea here. Okay. So, you know, there's a four-dimensional hypercube cube being rotated, and there's a um and entangled in EBIT, you know, with this spooky action at a distance as the lightning rod there. So if you try to look at it from a three-dimensional perspective, it, it doesn't make sense. Finally, you get to the, I call the information entropy divide, where you don't have space, time, matter, or energy. You have a five-dimensional five-dimensional space. It turns out there's another version of quaternions in 5D called, and Mike named the term Tauquinians. They are a Instead of being an all even algebra um, description, he calls them Talquinians, and they're a 5D diversion of, of, a, of a Quaternion and a Talquinian. So, even in a five dimensional world, you can simulate a three dimensional world because you have uh, Quaternions showing up there. Okay. And that's Escher's kind of thinking, you know, where you can walk around in a loop. And, and I don't know what 6D is yet. And so, we, you know, we've gotten that far. Um, but then you can have an n bit. How many dimensions if you have n dimensions? And that's the bit physics substrate for meaning and correlisms. If you have more than 20 minutes, the properties of correlisms start showing up. And, um, and I think that's the substrate for meaning because distance is not real distance there, but it looks like a correlation. That's why it's called correlisms. That correlation looks like meaning. And I believe that's the domain of thoughts. So for those who are interested in that, you know, my book goes into that part too as well. And so the, here's the bit physics substrate. Here's correlisms. We'll talk about that and more. And then eventually, I think there is an infinite dimensional space. You know, just, just put it this way. If you have Shor's algorithm and you have a 300 qub qubit quantum register and you're trying to do Shor's algorithm in it, it's two to the 300th states to do Shor's algorithm in a 300 qubit quantum register, right? Two to the 300th is more states than the number of particles in the known universe. It's that big. So these dimensions are, quote, cheating because you're using the quantum space 
that's much bigger than the physical classical universe is at all. And no wonder it can solve Shor's algorithm because it's cheating. It's using a uh, information substrate, which are all these states um, of quantum, quantum, you know, essentially quantum superposition and um, and expansion due to a quantum register. Okay, so when you look at all that, you go, well, can is real intelligence based on this? And yes, the answer is yes. The guy um, Hawking's who who found Palm Pilot and now he's working in um, a company and he basically says if you're not using this equivalent to correlative objects like this it's it's a, there's a generic class of this um Penti Canerva's work that's a bit physics bit physics model as well if you're not using that you're not doing ai because you're not using the properties of this space and so he he's gone on record and now he's doing a neuro company that's doing this okay um and so i'm i'm interested in real intelligence and even in something called what i would call infinite intelligence you can only be so smart if you're in a classical universe. But if you have a universe, you can be much smarter. And if you have an, indispens an, in an, an infinite number of the bit dimensions that you can use to, to do it, you can be arbitrarily in intelligent, infinite intelligent, and you're not limited by any classical space time limits. So, so I think about this stuff because I'm interested in, so how the mind works? Well, if, if this is related to neural computing, um, then the mind and brain model, we have to understand how all that works. So again, this is like a quick introduction to where I'm going. So now let's talk about, um, so these A, B, C, and D here are just bits. They're these bit vectors. And we just label them as a single digit vector. Um, and, and that means that they're all orthogonal, um, mutually, you know, they're, they're orthogonal to each other and they're orthonormal. In other words, they're all unit, unit length vectors, okay? So if you write A plus B is equal to B plus A, we're used to that. That's just associativity in mathematics. But this plus here means simultaneity. Okay, so math has a fundamental way of representing the simultaneity. It says A and B are two things that cannot, they're like apples and oranges. You can't say anything more than I say, I have a bucket with apples and oranges in it, right? That's what A and B means here. So there's an apple and there's an orange. And, and unless you're making apple and orange sauce, you know, fruit, fruit soup or something like that, they're just going to be separate like this, okay? And then you could also take, well, C minus D, we call this co-exclusion. Let's say you have C minus D, and then later on you have D minus C. Well, those two states, if you, they're mutually exclusive, because if you add them together, they give you zero. They can't be there simultaneous. So Mike's terminology is that's a co-exclusion. And it's a time-like primitive, and we use multiplication to do that. In order to get from C minus D to D minus C, you have to multiply it times something. So that's the operator. And so it's time, it's a time type of operator. Okay. So this is the basis how you think about geometric algebra as space and time primitives without having space and time. Okay. And and since there's no, since you only have concurrency and change you still don't have a light cone, okay? And if, so this is like pre-light cone and therefore it has to be the properties of this, of these, of this infrastructure, primitive space and time has to include um, space-like properties because space-like things like EBITs come as a result of using these. So the, the system itself is space-like in general and that's what A plus B is, it's space-like. And it's only when you start doing operators, okay, um, that you get the time like, you know, that you have change and you have operators. See, in computers, we think of memory as space and the CPU as time, but we can't think about it that, at level at the mathematics. We have to think about, well, here's a state. It's represented as a bunch of concurrent states like vectors. And, and you'll see in a minute, we'll, you're using a thing called multi-vectors as well. And then when you have operators on that, and those operators just are look just like quantum operators. And that's what you'll see here in a minute, okay? So one other thing I wanted to show you, that, again, this is Mike Manthe's demo here. It, what we're gonna do is what we're gonna do is the coin demo, okay? Coin demo says, okay, look, a person stands with both hands behind his back, okay? And then um, he shows you one hand containing a coin and then hides it again, okay? And then he again sh takes his hand out, shows another coin, potentially, it's indistinguishable from the first, okay? 
So what do you know at this point? Well, how many coins do you have? Does he have, right? And so the, this represents one bit because either he has a single coin or he has more than one coin, but you don't know the answer to that yet, right? So now we're gonna, now the person, act two, he holds out his hand again, showing two identical coins or tokens, okay? And when you do that, you have just received one bit since that ambiguity is resolved. So the big question is, where did that bit of information come from? And this is co-occurrence. It's that A and B occur at the same time. And when they do that, that represents a bit of information. And this is not the way normally Shannon information is. So it's the simultaneous presence of two coins. And, and that information is, has an effective energy due to Landauer's principle. And so we call this non-Shannon space-like information. And it's derived from simultaneity. And we believe that if the dimensions that were raw dimensions that were bit physics came together, however they came together in the beginning of the bit bang, this would release information and it would be the information that would, would have an effective energy that would fuel the Big Bang, the energy of the Big Bang. So we believe that dimensions coming together fuel the energy of the Big Bang. And that's where it comes from. And I'll show you again here in a minute. So here's one I did in a thought experiment that I did just to show you about, remember I was telling you about the smarter that you are, the more dimensions you have? Well, here's an example of that. So let's say I was taking um, an NP-complete algorithm and I said, I want to build it in this size computer. So that's the height of the blue line. It's essentially the volume of the computation computer that I'm doing, right? The, the size of the computer. And then I was to pick the size of the program. So it would run till the length of the universe. And so that algorithm for that size on that hardware wouldn't fit in time, wouldn't fit in the universe because you can't get the answer to it because it's too long, okay? So the other thing you could do is the other thing. You could say, okay, I want to solve this problem and I want to solve it in a certain limit of time. So the question is, how many CPUs would I have to put in a sphere defined by the light cone, the, 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 the speed of light size of that, of that to make that time, that the time the computation starts here and ends here on the other side of the sphere? I have a sphere there of, of that size. How many computer elements would I have to put in there in order to solve it in that amount of time? And the answer is you couldn't because you couldn't build the computer. There would be too many physical computing elements in there and it would exceed the black hole limit. So you couldn't build a computer like that when you're limited by time, okay? So these are the two extremes about a space bound and a temporally bound um, algorithm. It doesn't fit in the universe, but that's what Shor's algorithm is. It's a quantum polynomial time now. Using a quantum algorithm, it can solve the thing in a small thing because it's cheating. It's not using physical space-time resources. So again, I've been thinking about this stuff since 1996. Um, and this gives you a sense of quantum computing is so fundamental because it does things that Shor's algorithm, no classical algorithm can do. So quantum dimensions are fundamentally important to computational speed up and what I would say real intelligence ultimately and, and uh, infinite intelligence. And it's for these kinds of reasonings, okay? So now let's get to what we think is geometric algebra, okay? Geometric algebra is considered with these ve vectors and I represent them as these little, these little lines, these little vectors right here, but they can be plus or minus one, okay? So when I just showing you one side of the vector, and then there's a bivector, which is, I, I'm gonna show you in a minute here what that is. It's two of these vectors combined together and they form an outer product, which means that their grade is raised. So now they're a two dimensional object and a three dimensional object. And essentially you can have four in arbitrary number of dimensions. And then you can have lists of those and those are called multivectors. And this is all in the standard geometric algebra work um, Heston has also wrote a book on geometric algebra that was available back when I did my dissertation and then Doran's work as well. So, um, so if you want to look at these multivector spaces, this is just like Hilbert spaces, H1, H2, H3, et cetera. If you have G sub zero, G sub one, et cetera, all the way to G, it goes beyond that, but I will just focusing on this for now. So if you have G sub zero, all you have is the scalars, you have no vectors. So you have plus and minus one and zero, okay? And the size is three the, for the three states. And so it's not just two, it's three because zero is a valid state in there. You can't exclude the zero, okay? 
And that's what regular Boolean algebra is. It excludes the not, not their state. So it's really a tri-state logic. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. So then if you have a single bit, you end up having all the, all the permutations of the scalars and all the skirt orientations of the vectors and their sums. So you end up have nine unique states out of that. And this is bits, okay, that's just a bit. But it has not just one state, you know, it doesn't have just one bit, it actually has nine different unique states in there, okay? And we'll show about that in a minute. Then you get to qubits, and now you have A and B, but anytime you have A and B, AB is also automatically there, and I'll show you why in a minute. So you can't exclude this AB, and this AB looks like this, it looks like the outer product, not the outer product, the cross product of A and B, but it's just not a vector, it's a plane, it's a bivector, and it has an orientation of the plane. So geometric algebra solves this problem, you know, where now you have this graded space, you have single vectors and you have bivectors and you have orientations. And so you can think of this as a cross product, but it's not really a vector. So it's just similar in the, in the orientation is that way. And so that's why I showed this little icon. It's actually orthogonal to both of these, okay? And, um, and you can show that and you can prove that. Finally, you get to G3. Now you have A, B, and C, plus you have all the bivector permutations and you have this thing called the trivector. Well, this is the beginning of photons. You, you, you can have photons as an A plus B plus C this is a qubit, and this is a qtrit, a plus b plus c. That's a photon, and it, it has the properties where it's a boson, it's nilpotent, and we'll talk about that in a minute too. Okay, and finally you get to G4. Notice that the size of this is the, is, is the square of the sizes from the previous version. So by the time you get G4, you have 43 million possible states. And it's all the per all the variations of all of these 16, two to the the number two to the four is the number of unique elements in the space that are all distinct. And you can have 43 million variations in multivectors in that. And but this is you you have to have this size space before EBIT show up. You don't have enough topolo topological uh, consistency in lower number of dimensions than that. So that's why I say. EBITs, entangled spaces, are four-dimensional. And you can look at the regular Hilbert space and see the same thing if you stop looking at everything as vectors, okay? So, but one thing to remind, remember is this is an anti-commuting vector space. This is a key aspect of geometric algebra and inner and outer product definitions, okay? AB, the product of AB, which is really a bivector, is equal to minus BA, and it's because this is a right-hand right-hand rule spin. So the orientation based on the right-hand rule is either in or out. And if you flip and you go in the opposite direction, BA instead of AB, then you flip the side, right? So once you realize that this is anti-commuting, then if you take AB squared, you expand it out, you get AB times, you know, this is AB, AB, and this is really the outer product. So it looks like a four, ve four vector. But then if you swap B and A, substitute it in for here, then you get minus AABB. And if you substitute AA, A times A is one and B times B is one, so you get minus one. So every single bivector in the algebra is essentially the square root of minus one. It's a complex number. So complex numbers show up in the math without having complex numbers there to begin with. And so that's why we can do everything that we want to be able to do in regular physics without complex numbers, because the way a complex number is usually showed up, it shows up as a complex, as an I in some matrix column and row, right? So you're just saying, well, I is only related to that pair. Well, this is a unique way algebraically to say, well, I want a, a rotation in just this pair and you can do it using these bivectors. So again, a fundamentally different way of looking at um, complex numbers by looking at this anti-commuting algebra, okay? And we say it's, it's over Z3 is Mike's terminology. It's, it's essentially plus and minus one, which is equivalent to true or false, and zero, which does not exist. So essentially every vector has a coefficient in here, and that coefficient could be zero, right? And so you have to include that state as well as, as the zero state. And so you've had these operators, we talked about plus is now concurrency, 
multiplication is operator, and you have this geometric product, which is this, that's a geometric product, it's equivalent to the tensor product in regular matrix math. And you can show that it's equivalent. And you have the outer product, and the outer product is, since these are orthogonal, the outer product of two things that are collinear, which is A is collinear with itself, is zero, and the outer product of A and B is this bivector, and we write it as AB, even though it really is A outer product B, you know, this carrot. So the inner product is A times A is one, which we used a minute ago, and A dot B is zero. And so the actual geometric is the sum of the inner and outer product. And then these, all this comes out of it naturally. And the whole work that Hestinus did with geometric product and whoever followed him before that, there's a good long history of why the, the geometric product is the sum of the inner and outer product to get all the specifics about geometric algebra. And that's why it's so cool. So then we have the co-occurrence and co-exclusion we already talked about. And if you have A minus B gets turned into minus A plus B, then you, this implies that AB exists. And we can show you that again in a minute here. We also have one other thing. If you take an expression, any geometric algebra expression, and you compute the truth table for it, like you would a Carnot map, you can get what we call a vector. Think of this vector as the diagonal of the matrix um, if in regular matrix map. Then this ends up having a state, and we can treat that as a vector, and as it's equivalent to the algebraic version of it. So we have the state space version of it and the algebraic version, and they're equivalent. And you can go back and forth. They're reversible back and forth between the two. Okay. So I, so I built, to, to see all of this, I built a tool for my dissertation. And then after my dissertation, I rebuilt it in Python. So now I have this tool. And there's a whole lecture out there I did for AMPA two years ago. And you can download it. And it gives you the link to the thing. And you can go download this tool. You just have to install Python 2. And you then download this, unzip the the software, it's, I don't have it in get in uh, in any of the repositories, but I just have it free out there on my website. And then you can use the Redeval print loop to treat it like MATLAB, uh, Mathematica, where you're using it as a Redeval print loop to do things. So all the vectors are bound to a variable by the name of the vector. So a is the vector a is bound to the the variable called a. And so then you can write mathematical expressions. And so you can do a plus a. And this is the Z3. As you go, as you add one, you know, add one and one, you get minus one. If you add another one, you get zero. And then if you add one again, so it's this binary values like this. Think of it as mod to arithmetic that's symmetric around zero, if you want to think about it that way. Okay. So then if you take B times A, we can show anti community. We show all vectors in a sign of a sorted normal form. So if you enter B outer product A, it converts it to minus AB, which is the anti-commuted vectors. And same thing is true with tri-vectors. It puts them in standard normal form. And so these two flip sign. And if you have A, D times C times B times A, it comes up with an even number and, it, it, and, and its normal order is, is plus one instead of minus one. So this is the beginning of the signature of the space. It has to do, you could think of this term here as the pseudo scalar for this, for the for the for the G2 or G3 or G4. And it, each G2, G3, G4 has a sign based on this property right here. Okay. And so you can then see, I can say I want one plus A times one plus B plus one plus C. And it expands this out. And this is a multivector. And this is equivalent to the row state for 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. So it's the diagonal of the matrix that has a plus one in one, one corner, if you want to think about it that way. And what's interesting is this is the smallest row vector state in the space, which means anytime I have an A plus B or A plus B plus C, this is where those, it, in order to address one row in that vector, you have to have, this is a, this math here is essentially XNOR logic. And XNOR logic blows up Anytime you're trying to specify a very specific smallest element in the space, you have to use every single term in the space to address it. And so that shows the existence that for one row in the space, you end up having to have 
all the terms. And so anytime you have A and B plus C, you also have automatically generated all these other terms because otherwise you couldn't express the states for them. So this is an important lesson here just to say, oh, you can't just look at A and B and C as vectors. In a geometric algebra, you have to say, oh, well, then all the bivectors and trivectors are there also. Okay, it's a very important concept here. So what we can do is instead of just using A, B, and C, we can use whatever variables we want in a consistent way. And so I, I define things as, as a qubit state as A0 and A1, so they look like the cat notation, Brock cat notation, right? So we have cat sub zero and cat sub one. Well, I'm doing A sub zero and A sub one for, for qubit A. So that's what this looks like here. And then you have a spinner, you can define a field called S sub A, who is just the outer product. So you can look at that. And then if you, if you square it, if you take S, S sub A times S sub A, geometric product, you get minus one, that's what we showed. And if you take a qubit and you multiply it times the spinner, you get a rotation of, 45, of 90 degrees in the qubit space, okay? And if you take A times B, you have a, you know, a qubit for A and a qubit for B, this is a quantum register, then you get, this is the cat. It looks just exactly like the cat notation for a qubit. And it's using geometric algebra and it's using the geometric product instead of the um, product that Hilbert spaces use, the, the tensor product. But it looks exactly the same and it has the same meaning and the definition. So, so here's where the truth table comes in. If I have this little program that, that says, given a vector AB, it's a representation. This isn't just string. This is just a label for an object under there. And I can say, oh, I know there's A and B in there. And I can go through all the permutations of plus and minus one for A, and then compute the output state, which is if I have minus and minus, I get plus and like that. And I, this, is, this is what we call the truth table. And think of it just like a Carnot map, except that these states aren't mutually exclusive. They're all there simultaneously. And that's what, what's so interesting about that. And each of these rows are linearly independent. So what it means is I can take, um, and I have this program here that does the table view and I have a report that summarizes it. And you can say, well, the structure of this, and I'm gonna talk about this in a minute, but here's the row. And this is the bits and the signature and the vector and expression, vector notation. So you can see the last one here is I say A plus B and A plus B plus A minus B, one minus A and one minus B. And you can see it turns it into this expression that has a plus here and a plus here. So instead of having just a single plus in one row, that's what that's what this one is, I put a plus in two places in row zero and row three, okay? And it normally shows that this is the expression for that, and it naturally puts it in normal form. And if you were to just enter this expression, you would see the same state space. So you can see these are linearly independent, and you can add them to, you can use them to, if you want a state of a, a state space of a particular set like this, all you have to do is enter in the sub subterms, and I have a way of generating the J generators for that. I can just put in this row here and it generates the geometric algebra expression for it. So you can kind of use this truth table way of looking at what's going on, okay? So sort of the last key thing I'm gonna show you here about this is the complexity signatures. So let's say I have this, multi, this it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tri-vector, ABC, and it's our equivalent row vector is this, okay? And if I have plus one, think of plus one or minus one is like the diagonal of the matrix where there's all plus ones there or all minus ones there, okay? But if I add these two together, I get this result, right? Well, this state here is like, again, you can, tr you can do the math either in the algebraic form or in the row vector form and they're equivalent. And all the plus, the plus and plus, plus and plus and plus is minus, minus and plus is zero. You know, you just do the math. And so, you, so I was seeing that, so AB looks like A plus B, and then has the same structure to it. I call it the complexity. And what I've done is I've given any multivector in G and its corresponding row vector, count the number of zeros, ones, and minuses based on the counts of these elements in the row vector and sort the tuple. So I get a tuple that says I have zero of something and four of something else and four of something else. So the, the expressive ability of this vector is 4-4. Four, four. And I have to have enough elements in there to express that level of complexity. So for example, if I'm doing a Boolean logic and I only have one state in a 16 four by four dimension, I have to have a lot of terms in my AND expression 
to be able to express just one term. But if I have fewer terms, more terms in my Carnot map, then I need fewer of them. So that, again, the, the state space and the expressibility of the state space to limit or expand the number of terms in the state space uh, affects the, the, this. So what I've done is I've created this complexity signature, and you can show that for, you know, if all you have is scalars, you, all you have is this, this structure here, right? This, yeah. And, um, but if you go to n equals one, g sub, g sub one, you find out you have the scalars, there's three of them. And if, if you have the vectors, you have plus and minus x, and you also have plus and minus one and plus and minus x. Well, there's six of them that have this structure. They have one and one, and it looks like this that every time there's a plus in one, there's a zero in the, a minus in the other and vice versa. And if you were to count this bits, it's based on nine total states. You find out that the likelihood of this happening randomly out of the nine ends up being 1.58 bits. And the natural version of this one here is 0.58 bits. So you think, well, this is a vector, Doug, why isn't it one bit? Because you have to include all these other states in there, and there's really nine, not eight, and not even one, not even two, and not four, and not eight, but nine different states in your unique uh, geometric algebra expressions. And so you get this math. So this is the most likely, if you were just to create a vector and started randomly generating stuff in here, this is the most likely thing that you would get by a whole bit more likelihood than, than just the raw vectors by themselves. And this is important when you're bootstrapping a universe. Okay, same thing too is for n equals two. Um, turns out that these singletons, these are these, if you only have one term, it's called a singleton, no matter what this is. And so there, there only has one term like that. But there's 18 permutations of that with the state, state complexity of two, two, like this. Okay, and if you take a x plus y or plus or minus one, there's 36 variations of this that all have the structural complexity of one, one, two. That means they have one, one of like a zero, a one of a one, and two of a minus one, okay? So generally you have to have two terms to do that. And here is the Bitcoin, here's the coin demo. If you have just two of these terms, it's more likely by a whole bit, more likely than if you just had a single term in space. And here is the coin demo. It comes right out of the math. And this is an exact number. These are all discrete counts, okay? So all of a sudden we think that we were justified in doing this kind of thinking because now we can sort of classify how complex things are based on this signature. And then what we've done is we said, okay, we wanna go, if we go to higher number of dimensions, it makes a difference how many terms are in there. So we added this structural complexity term to it as well. So you can see there's three terms here cause you have to have everything. You have a very, but there's, there's 24 of those. So there, as you can see, the most likely thing is two items and the scalars. The next most likely is a row decode. So a single row decode is, is highly likely, which is all the expressions. And then finally, uh, the singletons are next likely. The, having single stray items like that just don't happen. And then finally, the scalars, they're highly unlikely um, by the same bit count, okay? So these signatures are the roots of indistinguishability is the key is because if two things look like they have the same structural complexity, that means they're probably rotations of each other. And rotations of it can be including in, you know, inverting or adding or multiplying at plus or minus one or adding plus or minus one or um, those equivalent transformations that are, that are reversible, okay? And so this is an important way of looking at this. And, it, and it's kind of a Shannonistic way of looking at all these states using Shannon kind of state math. Um, and then you can do the same thing for um, G4, G3, and then in G4 in a minute. But you can see the most likely state that happens is something that has one of one, three of the other, and four of the other, and it has four, four of these items in there. And an example is A plus B plus C plus some combination of a Vi vector. Well, this is the most likely state in G3. And this is equivalent to a Vi vector and a photon, and its complexity is 2.29, okay? Notice that the photon occurrence is 3.29, and then this is 5.29. This is a meson, 
we think this is a neutron here plus an XYZ, like this was plus XY, this is a neutron plus XYZ. And so you can see those are the most likely things to happen. And I just compressed this table. There's five more signatures in there with different bit counts. These are sorted by, bit, not by bit count, by sorted by signature. Okay. And likewise, you can do the same thing for G4. And just realize there's 34, 43 million states. And in order to do this table, I had to run it for a month back in uh, 2000. Okay. Well, actually, I didn't do this in 2000. I didn't have the structural integrity until 10 years ago, but it still took me a week to a month to write to run this. And the most likely candidate in a G4 is a something that has 11 singletons in it. And there's 5,000, 500, there's 5 million of those possible. And they're the most likely thing that occurs. Okay. And um, co occurrences do show up at 15 bits. So, Again, you can't say much about this because there's so many things I've compressed out of this table. Okay, so so now I'm just going to show you sort of a pictorial view of of how these bits bootstrap. I'm just kind of showing you that this is all the math and the tool and and how I look at it. And this is sort of a pictorial view. Is if you have a single bit, it looks like a vector like this. It has and this is the iconic representation I use: either plus or minus one. These are bit vectors. These are the proto dimensions. They're all orthonormal. And, and you have a scalar too. Don't forget the scalar. There are three orientations. Then you take two of these and it's just two separate bits. This the bit is orthogonal to the other bit. And then you have, we call those in, in regular quantum computing, we call these vectors. But think of it, this is the state for zero and this is the state for one and they both can be plus and minus one. But remember, as soon as you create this, you create the bivector also. And the bivector is, so what you end up having is a three-dimensional space, A, B, and this orthonormal bivector orientation here, right? Well, this plus and minus one is exactly equivalent to the Ketz, except I have real numbers instead of complex numbers, coefficient. This is just a vector space, two vectors. This is a vector space with two vectors. I only have real numbers, plus and minus one um, coefficients. They have complex numbers. So this Ket for a qubit, is really, a, think of it as a four dimensional space because it has two complex numbers, E times two, right? But because of the unitarity constraint um, that soon that the, the, the C, C zero squared plus Z, C one squared, square root of that is has to be one. This is, a, these are probabilities, their square is a probability, right? Um, so that if you have any three of these complex number values, the fourth one is automatically known. So it's really only a three-dimensional space if you think about the complex numbers. Well, that's what we have here too. We have a complex, we have A plus B plus this thing called AB, and it's sort of the general purpose complex number that's associated with the state space itself rather than a, co rather than a coefficient in the state space, okay? And so they're equivalent as far as the dimensionality goes either. But what we get here is, is we'll show this, and I've talked about it some more in other talks, but you get qubits, but you also get neutrinos. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Let's talk about what that means. So finally you get to Qtrit, and that's when you get trivectors and you get the quaternions and you can see visually see that J is equal to, if everywhere you have a vector here, you can realize that that vector is equivalent to a bivector. And so I, J and K are just bivectors and that's, there's no magic here. This is just regular bivector arithmetic. This is anti-commutative algebra. So all the rules for um, quaternions are so simple in geometric algebra. You can do it in the, in the tool in a second. Um, and then the other thing you have is you have things like these, these in vectors where you have plus X and then plus this thing Y and Z, which is the outer product of Y and Z. So this is a three-dimensional object but it's like, you can think of it as inseparable because you can't, this is an apple and a watermelon, right? You can't do anything more than just add them, but we think this is a quark, okay? But, and then you can see photons are literally, that's this A plus B plus C is literally the photon, it's the Qtrit. And this using the same kinds, of, we'll talk about it in a moment where we get um, bosons and uh, particles and it comes right out of here out of this same, same kind of math. But the big thing is when you go to E4, G sub four, 
the way you get there is by not just adding one more dimension, you take two qubits. And this is what you do in a quantum register. You take two qubits that are two bits, two, two states each, two vectors each, and you get this. So if you take A times B, it's equal to this ket notation. We just showed that, right? Well, if you, if you look at this qubit, it's just a two-dimensional thing, but they're each vectors. Well, an EBIT is nothing more than if you combine these is a two-dimensional thing, but they're bivectors. And that's the thing that regular vector mathematics uh, for Bell states and stuff like that doesn't realize that these are bivectors, not vectors. And so Hilbert space notation does a disservice because you think everything is a vector and not realizing they're really bivectors, okay? So um, it's much easier to think about it this way. And we found out early on that if you take the spinner for A and the spinner of E, and you think of this as a state, but you also think so, it turns out this is an operator. The other thing that geometric algebra has, it has the same representation for states and operators. See, regular Hilbert space has, well, I have states, which is a vector, vector column. And then I have the matrix thing, which is, a, which is the operator is a matrix thing. It's a, it's a square array, right? And so that you can't mix operators and states because they're different convention. But in geometric algebra, you can. So it turns out that the operator for Bell, the Bell state operator is just S sub A plus S sub B. And what this means, it says, I want the spin of A and the spin of B simultaneous. And it, and it writes like this, it turns out this, is a state as it looking at it as an operator, it's also inseparable. Likewise, the magic operator is the complex conjugate of that. And it's, or in this case, it's not complex, it's just a conjugate of that. And when you do that, you take the qubits, the qubit quantum register with A and B and multiple times the bell register, you get the bell state or the magic state. These are equivalent to the ket 0011. That's, and this is equivalent to the ket 0110. Okay, they're the exact same thing. Okay, and they're entangled. And so you get real insight about entanglement by looking at it this way. So I wanted to go through this with you to show you how we build this up and what it all means from a geometric perspective. Okay, so hyperdimensional spaces can be formed from infinite set of orthogonal bit vectors, but as soon as it has enough structure to support stuff, it ends up being in there, okay? So remember I was telling you, well, there, well there's nilpotent. So what is a nilpotent, okay? In geometric algebra, we can just say, well, here's a state X in a vector space defined by a certain number of vectors, and can we solve this? And, and, in, and in Python, you have these unnamed Python, un, unnamed functions called lambda. So you can just say, it's a function lambda given X, such that x times x, and then you put the second parentheses here, you put another lambda if you want here, or constant, you can say where x times x is zero. Well, this table just excludes zero times zero is zero. So, cause that's just, that's gonna be here all the time. But you find out that there's these states, there's only one in G2, x plus xy, which is, which is if you write, rewrite it, it looks like this. This is nilpotent and there's eight of them. And we think those are the weak force bosons, W and Z, okay? Um, and they're no potent. Likewise, reminding you that quarks look like this, that if you, you take A plus B plus C, they are eight of them, that's a Q-trit, and that's a photon. We think that's the photon. And here's the weak force bosons again in a higher dimensional space. But we also found out that the quaternions are also no potent, they're bosonic and the sense that space itself is nilpotent. And I think this might be the, the, extra fot the extra boson that they found recently. I don't know, K17, I forget what the name of, what their term is now. And if you realize, well, why, well, you say, why is this bosonic? Well, all you have to do is take A plus B plus C and multiply it times the pseudoscalar ABC, you get this term. So if you have something that's bosonic, and you multiply it by something else, it's still bosonic. Um, bosonic. So, so that's where that comes from. Um, the other one you get is mesons. Yeah, they say, well, mesons have mass, but they're really bosons. And really, they're just two quarks. So that comes in here. And then the strong force gluons is also there. So you can see that all the elements that we know of bosons 
show up by the time you have G2 and G3. By using just this simple expression here, x squared is equal to zero, okay? And that's why we think it's important. And likewise, you can do the same thing for G4, which I've done, again, running a month of computation back at the time. And we find that there's this bivector, which is the sum of all, with the right signs, it's the complete even subalgebra of G4. It has every single expression in it. And we think that's the Higgs boson. And we'll show you why in a minute here. So, so um, and the same thing is true here for the weak and force boson, but we also think that there is a W plus XYZ version of this. And we think that's a dark boson. So just looking for nil potents, you find all this topological structure out there that seems to have meaning. Um, and there's a total of 7,280 different states that are bosonic in G4. And G3 is equivalent to poly algebra, according to Mike. G4 is, contains Dirac algebra, and there's also Parseval's identity, which is related to um, frequency, um, frequency, frequency mapping. So, okay. So then the other thing is X squared is equal to one. We call these unitary. And so again, you, here's the solve expression. And there is one in G2, one expression, A plus B plus AB. We think there's eight of these, and we think this is the four neutrinos and four antineutrinos. You say, Doug, wait, there's only three neutrinos. Well, I can show you that topologically, there are four elements in this that have this structure and have this topology. And if you look at the state space of them, you can find out that one of these neutrino states is the sum of the three antineutrino states, and it has the same exact structure. So the problem is that if this is true, that there are four neutrinos. We just have never seen it because the only way to build it is not using neutrino evolution, but to take the sum of three antineutrinos, sum them together to get this new neutrino. And so we probably just never seen it in the wild. Um, so, um, so we believe that these, this, is, this is the only particle besides the vector itself. A vector squared is equal to one, right? Um, because its inner product is one, right? So you get neutrinos, but then you get electrons. We think this is electron, and we think this is the proton, which is the sum of a photon. It's the concurrent sum of a photon and electron is a proton. And if you take the protons and multiply it times the pseudoscalar, you get a neutron. So just think of one of these terms has, has a bivector instead of a single vector, and that's a neutron. And so this math holds up. These are all things that are unitary particles squared equals one. And, it's, and so far, we haven't invented anything but the topological properties of bits that we're looking at here, okay? And even the electrons, there's, there's 12 of them here. There's twice as many as normal. So we think the chirality of the electrons are also represented in here. Instead of having six electrons and their anti-electrons, um, you know, positrons, there's, there's twice as many as normal because of the chirality. So even that stuff shows up. Um, so then we have a bunch, we have 12,690 total signatures that are unitary in G4 too. We don't know what all that means yet. Okay, Six, 17 different signatures. Again, it helps to not have to look at 12,000, helps to look at 17 different signatures. And that's why the signature model is so useful for you looking at indistinguishability and uh, things like that, okay? Um, another important thing to realize is there's this property called unitary. You know, that's what we're talking about here. U squared equals the one, right? Unitary things, right? Well, it turns out there's this other property called idempotent. X squared is equal to X, right? Well, idempotent's behaviors for mathematics is important for measurement, right? And, and idempotent things are, not, are, are irreversible, right? And, but you can show mathematically simply that if you have that if you have an idempotent and you have a unitary, they're related by this formula. And the proof is simple: just take x squared, substitute it in, substitute u squared equals to one back in here, and you get back x. And so you can show that easily. So this is important to know where all the unitary items are, which are particles, and they're all related to the idempotents, which is the measurement operators, and they're all related. Okay. 
And by the way, my, my dissertation professor was a physics professor who wrote a book of mathematics for engineers, a physics book for engineers. And so he uh, was supervising me all through this. Essentially, I did my PhD in three years from 2000, from, from 1998 to 2002, um, in three years, essentially, by work and working full time. And he was my only professor, and I did all this work in, in three years while working full time. And he kept me honest about all this mathematics stuff because he has the book, uh, Cy Grant Terrell has the book on how to use mathematics for engineering um, for phys and physics, physics math for engineering. So, um, so he kept me honest about all this stuff. So when it's all said and done, this is how the standard model looks at from the Wikipedia, right? Here's the Higgs boson over here and here's the other bosons and here's the normal quarks up here at the top and the electrons and the neutrinos, okay? And I believe it really should be like this. It's just a non-standard topological model built on the number of dimensions, not built on just some arbitrary organization that they have to have a four by four table. But essentially it looks like this. And if you have G2, you end up with a table that looks like this with two bosons and four neutrinos. And again, it's because of the structure of the space itself that leads to the shape of this table. Okay, and then when you go to G3, you end up with this table and you get this additional quaternion boson here that we don't know what it is. And you get only electrons here um, and there's neutrinos um, and the neutrinos are over here. Okay, so they're, they're here, they kind of all lumped together, but they're structurally very different. These are two dimensional, these are three dimensional and all the quarks show up here also, okay, and they're antiquarks. Okay, same number, same quantity comes in. And then finally, the primitives in G5, you're gonna probably have bosons and unitary particles here, but you're gonna also have this Higgs and dark boson, okay? So there's 43 million states, there's 70 different particles and 30 different bosons in G4. I don't know what all of those mean yet, um, but this is the way to look at it from a topological, from, from one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional and four dimensional. Okay. And by the way, we don't do much in G5. We can do stuff in G5. You can't just do it exhaustively because 43 million squared is more seconds than in the universe, or more hours in the universe that have already existed. So you can't iterate through all of G5 um, because that'd be 43 million squared states. Okay. So, so let's talk about this entanglement one more thing here. I mean, this is an important way. I mean, I remember I told you we're looking at entanglement as bivectors, not as vectors. So first of all, entanglement, as you know, is a quantum property. It only shows up in quantum properties. And in fact, quantum systems and in fact, Einstein didn't like it because he thought it was spooky action at a distance. So there's no classical equivalent to entanglement, period. Okay, so you just have to get used to that. And it's non-local in 3D because it's actually four dimensions. Okay, and so that was spooky, Einstein's spooky action at a distance. And then finally, he was showing that EPR um, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen says, hey, these, these operators are well-defined, but you, you, that's what he came with the spooky action and distance is the EPR paper, right, back in the 30s. And then finally, John Bell, and, the, and these are known as inseparable quantum states because you can't factor them, okay? Well, what's, when, what I found out in, in, back in my dissertation, I proved it two ways, is that this operator, um, S sub A plus S plus or minus S sub B, is you can't find the inverse of it. So the Bell and Magic operators are actually irreversible in, G4, in, in geometric algebra, which is a stunning difference compared to what a regular Hilbert space does. And it says that, it, it, what it says is that entanglement is stable because information has been erased. And so if you don't have anything interacting with it, that entanglement persists forever until something interacts with it and adds the information back into it. And so it's, it's, a, sta it's a stable is, uh, a qubit is if there's no noise in it, okay? So, and so qubits are multiple things acting as a one, that's an e-bit, and it's, think of it as a higher dimensional version of a qubit, okay? It's just with bivectors instead of single vectors, okay? So let's, what it looks like, this is what it looks like in regular Hilbert space, right? You have the, these two state spaces here, that's what their normal labels are for them in the literature. And you can think of that as they take two, they take a single high energy photon and they go to put it through this material and generate an entangled photon pair of lower frequency. And it creates these two 
entangled states where they these are both up and these are both uh, up and down and these are both left and right, right? And so this looks like zero, zero, one, one. This is another way of looking at it. Um, and this is zero, one. This means that if you measure one of these, the other one will be exactly the same, or the, you, that's one state. Or if you measure one, the other one, or other one is the opposite state, because that's what the zero, one, and one, zero means. It says, if you measure this state, this will be zero, the first qubit will be zero, and the second qubit, qubit will be one, and vice versa. Okay, so this is where that comes from, okay? So this is the same, I'm just kind of going through this again. Looks like this, this is the operators. This is the com conjugate, if you want, if you think about it that way. And you can show that given B, the qubit times the Bell operator, you get this state. And if you multiply that again, times the Bell operator, you rotate around. So this looks exactly like a qubit. And this looks exactly like the Hadamard transform, but higher dimensional version of the Hadamard transform in G4. Okay. And so these are all the Bell states. And then these are all the magic states. Okay. Um, and... And this equation holds true in G, if you go to higher dimensional spaces too, G5, G6, G7, you can find the equivalent expressions for that um, in these higher dimensional spaces. And I did it, I did it up to G10, um, where I showed you that this is true. You can create a central space in G10. And the, the properties are very similar to this, okay? And this is an operator that rotates around these entangled spaces in higher dimensional space. And so the key thing is you can't factor these and these are irreversible. And I proved this exhaustively. I, I looked for, show me the expression that if I multiply, if I multiply that expression times S, S of A plus, plus or minus S of B will give me back the original expression. And I exhaustively did that. Like I said, it took me a month back then at the time. But I also showed it in my dissertation doing it closed form. I did the proof in my dissertation. So you can go find that page out there and find that proof. But the reason why that it can't be is that if you look at a regular qubit, it looks like A0, and this is a regular qubit. This is the cat notation, 00011011. But if you look at the underscore sign area, you can realize that this, once you know that these are Bell states, you realize, oh, this part underlined is Bell sub three, B is the Bell state. And the part that's not underlined is a magic state sub three. So really every qubit is the sum of a Bell states and magic states. That's what's so cute, cute about this. You don't just treat these as vectors. You realize that, oh, this has its own substructure to it. But if you know that anytime I multiply any this is true in general because they're comp, comp, conjugates. Anytime you multiply anything that's in the Bell domain times anything in the magic domain because they're complicate, conjugates, they cancel. So Bell times, Bell times magic is equal to zero. The Bell state times any magic state is zero. Any magic operator, the magic operator times any Bell state is zero or any Bell state or magic state multiplied, they're all zero. So anytime you get this operation, Anytime you apply the bell or magic state to this thing, the other one cancels and you get multiplicative cancellation. And if you go look into Chris Doran's book, when he's talking about geometric algebra in the very beginning of the book, it's the first thing he tells you about, about multiplicative cancellation. And I don't see multiplicative cancellation in regular Hilbert space at all mathematics. And this, uh, because, because Hilbert spaces treat these as vectors. They don't treat these as bivectors. And you only get information erasure when you have um, by vector spaces or more, okay? So this information erasure is irreversible. And by Landauer's principle, you can't ignore it. So again, here, this is, this is really important stuff. And I learned this stuff 20 years ago, and it's been taking me 20 years ago for the rest of the world to catch up with my thinking about this and how important this is, okay? Well, and you go, well, this is all great, Doug. So what are you going to do about it? I mean, well, it turns out you can go in and build these Talquernians <laughs> in, in four or five dimensions, you can, you can remind, remember that these are the Quaternians, and you can show that the Talquernians in a four-dimensional space is just these T sub i, T sub j, and G sub k. So they're equivalent to i, j, sub k's, right? And that the T sub i, T sub j, and D, G sub k essentially is a higher dimensional version of the regular quaternions. Instead of having one term in it, it has two bivectors in it. Okay, and there's sets of these. And you can show that there's T, 
you know, the, the conjugate of it as well, okay? And you can show that they're anti-commutative because it's all bivector math, just like the regular things are in bivector math. And they have this property where I sub j, sub j to k is equal to plus one. And what this is, this is equivalent to a sparse version of minus one. So that's what you'll see here in a minute here that what I mean by that. So this property of minus one is true here. It's just in a higher dimensional space. And the reason is, and if you take plus and minus one, you get plus and minus one, that's a sparse plus one. Okay, so you have sparse minus one and you have sparse minus plus one, and here they are. You can have various versions of this, but here's the state space. And you can see this is like the diagonal of the matrix, instead of all being minus one or all being plus one, they're sparse, they're distributed out and they're symmetric. Okay, so the state space is embedded in another higher dimensional space, but it has the exact same properties of state transformation. And so then if you show the tables like this, this is the definition of the quaternions and you can see what they all are, and you can see how they're all related to the Bell and magic states, okay? So this is a fundamental difference because now all of a sudden, we can see that you have three-dimensional, you can simulate a three-dimensional object like this, three dimensions in a four-dimensional space by using these uh, tau cornians as um, tau cornians, um, as quaternion isomorphs in a higher dimensional space. And this is an important idea because from a simulation perspective, if you have higher dimensional space, you wanna be able to simulate a lower dimensional space inside that, right? So that's why we're doing this. So finally, when we were looking at this and Mike was showing me, Mike was saying, hey, I think this is the Higgs boson because it's nilpotent. And so I, I looked at it, I said, well, Mark, Mike, all of these terms are entangled. And so it turns out if you take T sub i that we just showed you there, right? T sub i, T sub j, K, D sub k, instead of treating them as sets, sum them. So this is a complete even subalgebra of the space now, because these are all bivectors and there's six of them. Um, and you get, there's eight triplets altogether, eight variations and eight more for that, because of the plus and minus, right? And you, you find, you can say where h sub square, h squared equals zero. And you can find all the iterations of that just by replacing all the signs. Um, and you can find all those. And you can find that the Higgs boson um, looks just like that. It's, it's literally that. And we think it's, it's a Higgs boson. And, it, and what's interesting is it's 2D. It's mainly bivector math, okay? So um, that's why it interacts with all the other masses that have um, bivectors in them because it's, it's 2D underneath, okay? But you can rewrite the Higgs to look, made it look like this or this. And what's interesting, it means the same thing. And these are both simultaneously there. This looks like time, this is according to Mike, time-like mass acts on space. So you have mass and space, and here you have a photon and space, light and space. So you can rewrite the Higgs to look like this, and that's what it means. So it turns out that there's other states that are even in the even subalgebra, but there's 16 of these states where x squared is equal to zero. And you know when you got them because they're anti-commutative, they're, they're commutative here. Because if, you, because if you take x times abc and equals to abc times x, it's equal to plus or minus x. It changes the sign of x, but this is true for this, okay? But there's also this other set of bivectors where if you get x squared, you don't get zero, you get plus, plus or minus a, b, c, d, okay? And there are 16 of these where only when x is equal to this, so that you don't get a sign inversion. So this is true here, and there's 16 of them, and that's the signature of them, and there's 32 of theirs, and that's the signature of it. Now you can see the advantage of the signature. So. So um, we believe these two are novel, inter novel things that we never saw before. And it shows that this, this Higgs is related that square, it's, it's a bosonic here, but here it says, well, when you square it, you get the mass primitive. We might, this might be the graviton, but basically you're getting the pseudoscalar for the G4. So these things are fundamental to G4 because they, they create the pseudoscalar. So we call these M for mass um, primitives. So that's, that's where we came up with that terminology, okay? So your head's ready to explode yet? Let me give you one more thing to do here. So 
So then you say, okay, if I have these bivector pairs, which are all entangled, and I rotate them in G3 with using this, the three pseudoscalar for G3, I get something that looks like this, an odd algebra. Instead of an even algebra, I get an odd algebra. And also you can reverse it, you can reverse it back, right? So if you have these entangled states and you multiply it times the pseudoscalar for G3, you get these. But what you should know is that, that this is the odd algebra and it looks like this topologically. So you're converting something that's two and two to one and three, okay? And what you find is that's true for the magic states as well. And we think these are, we could call dark bosons. You could also think them as dark quarks because it looks just like the quark structure, but a higher dimensional version of quark, but they're all nilpotent. And they're all entangled because they're all inseparable. You can't separate these any more than you can separate those, okay? And so if you look at dark energy and dark matter, you know, we're, we're only looking at the standard model as these 4%. What about all this other stuff? And this stuff just sort of pops out of this, you know, and this is some of the work that Mike did and I'm just sort of reporting it here, helped him analyze it and helped him write the tools to do some of this stuff with, you know, so this, a lot of this work was Mike was working on this. From the time I graduated, he worked on it for eight more, eight to 10 more years after that. And then I helped him more do more analysis and start writing more up about it. And uh, so this is, this is the kind of work he did. And so that's why I'm saying this is the quark structure we think. And so this looks like a dark boson, but it also looks like a dark quark. So you say, hmm, dark quarks. Well, that might be interesting. And it is because you can take the sum of four of these dark bosons or dark quarks. And remember, if you get a photon, to get a proton, um, you take three quarks and sum them, right? Right? Well, what if you took four dark quarks? Turns out you can get this D for dark matter and it's quark-like math, but using four-way addition rather than three-way addition. And it's the largest odd subalgebra of G4. Before we had the largest even subalgebra. This is the largest odd cell algebra for G4. And you get an expression that looks like this, where it's H or M. And so they're, they're come in four, three or four turn, forms, depending on how you do it. If you take, this is the qubit perspective. This is the Q, I forget what Q means. But if you take D sub squared for this, you get quaternion, okay? And there are 128 of those. Likewise, if you, if you take D sub zero, there are 32 of those with this signature and they are much more prevalent 30 to count of 32, they're highly, the bit count is 543. They're highly, they're highly unusual. Um, no, they're more common. And these are bosons. So these D squared are bosons. So, you know, um, and then you get these here, which are essentially U. And if you take them squared, you get two qubits, such that if you take eight of these, you get one. Okay, and there's two signatures of those. Uh, as well, and there's 80 there and 16 there. So this this is the structure of this, and it, it's like quark like we think this might be related to dark matter, uh, the same way that regular matter is built of quarks. This is made out of dark quarks, and uh, and that's where we it just pops out of this topological structure, and you just have to sort of mine the top, topological structure to do that. So so I know we've gone through this quickly. And I have more talks out there that go into this even more depth. I'm just trying to give you a survey of all of this, right? And, um, and I know I've gone way over the limit of time and I apologize for that. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about contrast adjustable memories. And, um, and I've given more talks about this, but essentially if you take a high dimensional space and you pick random points in there, all the, all the points in the right, all the randomly generated points are equal distance apart. And, and it looks like this kind of distribution. And so, but the statistics, the, the standard deviation is doesn't change as a number of dimensions because that, that's all just probability that gets washed out. So you can treat two points that are high, high, highly uh, distance away from each other and their standard deviation is so narrow, they look like unique points in the space. And in fact, you can show that their standard distance away, n over six, and the standard deviation does not change with n. And so that's why this property has this property. 
And there's a standard radius too, which is n over 12. Um, and so you can think of this as this little iconic thing down here. And this is the midpoint. This is two random generated points. And you can treat this as a radius, a radius and a standard distance. And for the size of n, these things are con relatively constant. Um, and you can think of this standard distance and standard radiance as a metric for complexity inside. Um, and this is also known as sparse distributed coding, um, which, um, and it turns out it's related to spread, spread spectrum, which we use in our cell phones. Because what do you do when you, you create a spread spectrum? You create a bunch of orthonormal ortho codes. And those codes are mathematically only show up in mathematics, but you can use the mathematics to decode those channels, right? Well, that this does the same thing with randomness. It uses randomness to pick orthonormal points. Um, they're not ortho, they're normal, but they're normalized if you if you normalize them with by the radius. So the mathematics of meaning is on this address. That's why I call it content addressable memory. The address is the meaning, okay? And you can think of this as little vortices of things that are related, show up next to each other. And these little vortices is part of the idea of law of attraction, if you know anything about law of attraction. Um, but it shows up in the mathematics here. But here is the, here's that iconic view again that we did for the book. There's a book out there on coral rhythms. And that as a result of a SBIR contract we did for a million dollars um, from the government. And we showed that these vectors are like orthogonal and you can find out the normalized distance if you normalize everything by the radius, which is square 12, um, then you end up with all these distances are, are constant. And so the, every, all the distance are orthogonal and you see that the standard radius 90 degrees. And now you can, you know, if you have 12 dimensions, 12 dimensions doesn't give you coral of them objects, but it has a particular thing where naturally the radius is one because the dimensions are 12. Um, and so I think we can have bit vectors, thought vectors, vectors in this space that are near each other or not. And this shows up as bullseyes and that's an information content. So a point in the space that shows up repeatedly near one other point is highly unlikely because all random points are far distance away from each other. And you can use the standard distance and standard radius to show that there's information content. And all that's in that book on correlithms that you can get on Amazon. So, um, so here's the summary, it's the last slide. I know I've gone over, um, but I wanted to really give you guys a sense that all this is tied together. So as space-like bits coalesce in the bit matrix, they form qubits, bosons, particles, e-bits, um, space-time is based on bit state likelihood. These, so you start out with G1 again, and that's about 0.58s each, 0.58 bits for each equivalence, for each, each bit of those. And then you go to, and the complexity is increasing. Finally, you go to G2 and you get neutrinos in the coin demo. And that's about 2.178 bits each for each vector. And then finally you go to quaternions in G3 in a three dimensional space, but photons and mesons show up in there and all the standard model quaternions. And then finally, that's how much each vector is worth 7.29 bits in that space. Um, and then finally you get to G4, you get a four dimensional space and you get to quaternions entanglement and we think dark matter and dark energy are also entangled. And um, finally you get to Tauquinians. Here's a five dimensional hypercube. And we think space time emerges in here. Um, that if you look at Chris Doran's work out there on relativity using geometric algebra in his book, um, he talks about, or in his, in his papers, he talks about it as being G5 as well. And so you can get full relativity in G5. So things start showing up with the right properties in G5. So finally, then you get G sub n, which is get these space-like correlithms. And I think we get these th thought vectors in standard, standard, and you know, you get the, the, the bit matrix view and the law of attraction ideas where there's things that are correlated and those correlations are antithesis of entropy. And so they're or or ordered and they have information content. And so if they have information content, there's an equivalent energy there as well from Landauer's principles. So, so you can find all my papers out there. I thought you guys would appreciate this next one here. Here's a topological thing that you can't build in the three world, but you can visualize it. And then also the three dimensional, um, four dimensional hypercube that's, that's rotating. So hyperdimensional spaces are counterintuitive for a whole,
bunch of different reasons, not only from bit physics perspective and qubits perspective, but from entanglement perspective and from core rhythms perspective. I'm trying to give you a sense that it's all related and it's and you can read more about it in my book, which goes into more stuff too besides the standard model. Um, but uh, in, and if you're interested in deep, you know, you know, the mind and I call it real intelligence because it's related to neural neural computing. I don't think that neural computing will ever be as smart as humans, real and real intelligence. And the reasons for it, that the mind is really a hyperdimensional space, not in the brain. Um, and so there's a little teaser for why you would want to go look at my other articles or not, you know, uh, or my book uh, about that subject. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation.